Okay, let's get started. Um, as promised, we'll do a little bit of uh, PyroSim tips and tricks at the first few minutes uh, of class. Any questions about any of the projects you're working on? Okay, a couple things this morning. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, creating ball and socket joints. So, so far, all of the robots you've been creating more or less have been using hinge joints which connect two neighboring objects together and cause those two objects to rotate relative to one another through a two-dimensional plane. Um, you can simulate a ball and socket joint by connecting pairs of objects together to allow this rotation, this rotation, and if you want, this rotation as well. And the trick in order to do this is very similar to what I showed you last time with uh, wheels and axles. So let's say we have some main body. We're looking at our robot uh, from the side. And we have some leg here. And we would like the shoulder joint, like our shoulder joint, to use a ball and socket joint. You can place a second cylinder with length equals 0 inside the top of the leg itself and connect the main body to the ball, if you like, with a 1 degree of freedom rotational joint and then connect this ball to the leg with a second hinge joint that rotates through the other uh, two-dimensional plane. And those two hinge joints would have two different joint normals, right? So that would give you this and this. If you want to get the full three degrees of uh, freedom rotation, the twist as well, add a second ball, attach the main body to the first ball, the first ball to the second ball, and the second ball to the leg. Make sense? OK, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, I met with a couple of you this week and last week, and you were struggling with coming up with a good fitness function. Uh, don't be disheartened. This is a difficult thing to do in evolutionary robotics. So a good way to think about your problem is to try and break it down into sub-behaviors. So if you remember back to our lecture on bipedal locomotion, there was one term D that's selected for maximum distance, and that was multiplied by a second term, which was 1 over uh, 1 plus Z, which was to minimize the amount of rotation about the Z axis and so on. So go back and have a look at that lecture, and you'll see they're multiplying together these terms to select for to select for things they want and select against things they don't want. So for example, you might create a fitness function where F1 might be, for example, let's imagine you're working on the throwing robot. So you have an arm and a hand and then an object uh, sitting on top. The, your first fitness component might be to just throw this object as far as possible. So this actually selects for throwing. Forget about trying to get this object near this object. So you might define F1 as just how far to throw the object. Stick that in, evolve for a couple of minutes, play back your, your most fit creature, and make sure you're getting more or less what you have in mind. Then you might go back and change your fitness function where you multiply F1 by F2, where F2 might try and minimize the distance between these two objects. In this simple cartoon example here, you can probably get away with just F equals F2 and get a robot that throws the object as close to the target as possible. But for some of the other projects that you're working on, some of the other ideas I've seen, it might help to uh, try and break your fitness function down into these different components and go back and forth between a little bit of evolution and a subset of these components to make sure you're getting what you, what you want, right? rather than trying to put it all together. So this is not unlike what we were doing throughout the final projects, where you'd add an object or add a joint, <laughs> play the simulation, make sure everything is what you expect, add in the next piece, the next piece, and the next piece. A common mistake when you're creating a fitness function is to come up with a relatively complicated equation, run it, and it's hard to tell whether evolution is making any progress or not. The behaviors you're getting may be hard to distinguish them from random behaviors. And remember, that's one of the things we're going to be looking for when you present your final project in, the, in our exam slot, is can we see just by watching two videos that there is a distinct difference between a random controller and an evolved controller. Okay, 
Yes. Uh, just a general question about that. Sure. I think it applies to a lot of people's projects. Okay. So if, if in the if within the goal of whatever the goal is, um, locomotion, mm -hmm. some form of locomotion is somewhat necessary. Um, yep. Could you could you put that in first? Or could you, how would you go about that? Yeah, pretty much, right? So locomo as, as we talked about, locomotion is tricky, right? So get from point A to point B, and then do whatever you're supposed to do when you get to point B, right? That's, yes, definitely. Other questions? Okay, why multiply the terms rather than add them? You may have noticed throughout this course, most of the fitness functions we've seen that have multiple terms or multiple uh, variables in there, they're usually multiplied rather than added. One might swap the other. Uh, exactly. Too large. That's it. So depending on what your uh, your fitness components are, they might have much larger, smaller ranges, right? So let's imagine, for the sake of argument, that F1, generally speaking, tends to range between zero and ten, and F2 tends to range between zero and one. Let's say. Okay. So let's imagine now, for example, uh, we were going to add. We were going to start by adding these together, and let's imagine to begin with, with some random controller gets a value of f1 equals to one and f2 equals to one. Actually, I mentioned this one ranges between zero and one, so this would be maximal. Let's assume we get this. Then we get uh, a mutation that doubles this value and halves this value. Now remember that f1 ranges between 0 and 10, and f2 only ranges between 0 and 1. So we've made some actually small percent increase in f1. It's only gotten 10% better. This has gotten 50% worse. If we sum these together, we'd have 2.5, which is larger than 2, so that child would win out. So changes in f1, which has the larger range, are swamping changes in f2. If we multiply them together, then multiplication is agnostic to the ranges of these uh, two fitness components, right? So 2 times 0.5 is the same as 1 times 1. The child is no better than the parent, right? So usually what you're interested in in your fitness function is percent increases in these different uh, components. So it makes sense to multiply them together rather than, than add them. Okay. So adding them is the worst thing you can do. Multiplying them together is better. But as you probably saw in the photo taxes assignment, still doesn't work great because evolution may still try and increase one component and sort of forget about the other one. So the next best thing you can do is to take these two and break them into the two separate fitness components, which we've seen a few times now, and use multi-objective optimization where we're trying to create a Pareto, a Pareto front of solutions. So each dot here corresponds to one controller or one robot that gives you a gradient of competency from F2 specialists all the way through individuals that are getting better at all terms to F2 specialists. Okay. As I think I mentioned before, multi-objective uh, optimization works great in, uh, for two components. But when we start to add three components, our Pareto front is no longer a line. It becomes a surface. And it becomes easier and easier for individuals to inhabit that surface. And you get a collapse of the Pareto front, meaning that at three or more objectives, you have all individuals on the front, and it becomes impossible to decide who, di who dies, because everyone should survive. They're all on the front. So uh, this is just a reminder that if you do want to try out multi-objective optimization, I would suggest you stick with two objectives and get creative with additional terms if you have more terms than, than two. OK. One last thing I'd like to cover in terms of uh, fitness functions is um, using actual time steps to select for intermediate behavior. So someone was asking about locomotion, and then once you get to point B, what do you do at point B? So you can, you can formulate a fitness function that asks for certain conditions or certain behaviors 
at certain points in time. So let's go back to our cartoon example here of our throwing robot. Let's imagine that it's now going to try and throw this object through a basket. Okay, so we've got a basketball playing robot now. Um, if you were to select, for example, to just minimize the distance between the basketball and the basket, which is maybe just F1 here, you might get perverse instantiation where evolution keeps throwing the ball at the rim. So you'd like to modify your fitness function to get it to throw the ball up because you know that getting the ball up in the air midway through the evaluation period is going to help evolution eventually discover a controller that gets the ball through the basket. Okay, so how could we modify our evolutionary system to incentivize or search for controllers that get some arc in the throw? How might we go about doing that? Z, Z is height. I checked before class. Z is the, uh, height. The boxes as the box travels. You can check Z, the vector Z is at a travel, and so then you pick the largest one. Exactly. So we could say, let's leave F1 as trying to minimize the distance between uh, the ball and the basket. So F1 is what we actually want the robot to do. We could define F2 to say maximize the height, which is the Z component of a position sensor which is sitting in the box, is sitting in the ball. So let's assume we embed, embed a position sensor in the ball, and we're trying to maximize the Z component of the ball at time step 500 out of 1,000 time steps. So Z sub 500 here is just my shorthand for saying we're going to evolve, uh, we're going to evolve throwing controllers that maximize the height of the ball midway through the evaluation period. Okay, that's one way we can do it, by modifying the fitness function. Another thing you might want to try and do, if you want to try and minimize the number of components in your fitness function, is you could, do, you could modify the environment. You could put an obstacle uh, halfway between the robot and the basket, which will penalize throwing the ball directly at the edge of the, the basket. So lots of different ways you can try and incentivize or influence the direction that evolution is going to go. But again, start with, your, uh, start with a naive guess for your fitness function, and if perverse instantiation arises, then think about modifying your fitness function and or modifying the environment. Okay, sound good? Okay, so let's uh, jump back to lecture now. Uh, we are going to finish lecture 24 here on the evolution uh, of communication. We've got a few more slides left there. And then we're going to move into the final theme uh, of the course, which is evolving bodies and brains. And as promised, uh, evolutionary methods, one of the reasons why we want to use evolutionary methods in AI and robotics is evolution is not specific to the brain, right? Learning methods, even state-of-the-art learning methods like deep learning, are specific to optimizing neural networks. Evolution in nature evolved not just our nervous systems, but our body plans to go along with our nervous systems. So as you'll see as we make our way through these uh, four separate attempts to evolve bodies and brains, it's challenging for two reasons. One of them is that the evolutionary algorithm is going to become more complex. We're going to expand or broaden evolution's reach to be able to tinker with body and brain simultaneously. So the algorithm is going to be more complex. And things become more difficult for evolution. Because if evolution makes changes to the uh, body, the brain may no longer work well with that body. Alternatively, if a mutation alters the, uh, alters the body, it may no longer work well with the brain and vice versa. So evolution is going to be trying to co-optimize these two subsystems, and changing one system often breaks, changing one subsystem often breaks the adaptation between these two systems, right? They both need to work uh, together, as we saw in embodied cognition. How do we get our evolutionary algorithm to be able to optimize or change bodies and brains at the same time? Tricky thing, tricky thing to do. Okay, we'll see that uh, in the next few lectures. Uh, final project. So undergraduates, you're now working on your, week, your third weekly report where, like 
Weekly report number two, you're implementing your next weekly work package. Remember when you submit weekly report three next Monday night, put a sentence or two in there for the TA saying, Rob, remember that I was trying to do this this week and here's a screenshot or a video demonstrating that I successfully did so. Or alternatively, Rob, re recall that I proposed to do this this week, but given what I learned from last week, I've modified my, my work package in this way. I was now attempting to do this, and here's a screenshot and a video showing that I implemented it correctly. Okay, next Tuesday, uh, you will have done, you'll be finished with your weekly reports, and you'll have from next Tuesday all the way through till our exam period to finish up your final project and prepare your oral and written reports, or your oral and written uh, aspects of your final project, and we'll talk about those again next Tuesday. Okay, so back to the evolution of communication. Remember this is part of a two-part lecture series on uh, evolving robots to work together, to do things that are beyond the ability of any one of them. Um, this is a challenging thing to do until you're able to communicate, right? We saw the lions last time that were able to capture the gazelle. They could only sort of signal. They could see what their other lion compatriots were doing, but the lions couldn't say, all right, I'm going to do this at next time step. Don't tell the gazelle, right? However, that's a very useful tool to have if you want to coordinate behavior on a larger scale. So in lecture 24, we're looking at uh, groups of agents which don't really do anything very interesting except evolve the ability to communicate. And again, communication is useful, but it's challenging for evolution to discover because you need the evolution of a signaler, someone who emits language, and at the same time, in order for that uh, particular signaling strategy to survive, there has to be someone who hears it, and mates with the signaler to produce children that can both signal and respond appropriately to that, that signal, right? So evolution is hard, language is hard to evolve because you need a speaker and a listener simultaneously. In the simple experiment we saw last time, we, see that we saw that this is possible. We have immobile females that emit songs, and the songs that they emit uh, evolve because we're evolving neural networks for them. So the output layer of the female neural networks is a song. Males are mobile. They can move. If they happen to move within the song radius of a female, the males hear that song and they hear it in the sense of the song arriving on the input layer of their neural networks. And the value arriving at the output layer of their neural network dictates which of four actions they perform. Stay still, move forward, turn left, or turn right. Okay, remember they were moving on this uh, toroidal grid. And we saw last time that at the beginning, males move randomly. After a while, they evolve to just move straight all the time. So they're not listening. After a while, we start to see some males that turn right when they hear one song and turn left when they hear a second song. So we are now starting to see the evolution uh, of language. And we ended last time by seeing how this works. We have a male moving forward. The female senses the male, where the male is and what direction the male is moving in. And she changes her song to change the behavior of the male and direct the male in towards herself. Uh, and she's able to capture a male, and they produce two offspring, and we have the evolution of language. Okay, last piece of this experiment, we're going to try and analyze exactly how this evolution <coughs> of language occurs. And in order to do this, the investigators simplified the experiment a little bit. In this case, the female neural networks are going to have just two output neurons which means that the females can only emit one of four songs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. So we've simplified the range of songs that the females can emit. And the males have two input neurons to hear that song. However, they can still do one of four actions. So far, so good? OK. So given that simplification, we can now represent every single male out of the, every single of the 800 males 
and what they do when they hear what song. So how does this work? Well, let's look at each entry in this table, and you'll notice that in each entry of this table, there are four digits here. Each of these digits corresponds to one of the four songs. So this is uh, song one, song two, song three, and song four. This particular group of six males go, does nothing, stay still. Remember, zero is stay still. Stay still if you hear song one, song two, song three, or go forward if you hear song four. And at this point in time, at the beginning of the simulation, there were six males that had those four behaviors in response to those four songs. What about these four males over here? What are they doing? Should actually be four zeros there, not three zeros. Nothing, right? They will stay still regardless of which of four songs they happen to hear. Uh, yeah, this I think is just a typo. So this indicates that there are zero males in this particular category. <laughs> Let's go all the way down to the bottom right. There are six males here. What do these six males do? They always turn right. They always turn right regardless of which of the four female songs they hear. Right? And as you would expect at the beginning of this simulation where all the uh, males and females have random neural networks, the females emit songs at random and the males react randomly to the songs and we get a uniform distribution of males with different behaviors across the board. Right? Okay. So like before, we're now going to walk through one evolutionary run, and we're going to see snapshots of change in male behavior. After 8,000 time steps in this simulation, you can see that most groups of males have gone uh, extinct. Not surprisingly, this group up here, if all you do is ever stay still, you're very unlikely to mate, and away you go. Okay, same thing in the bottom right. If you always do the same thing, regardless of the song that you hear, you're also likely to go uh, extinct. Okay, somewhere in here, I can't see it at the moment, maybe one of you can, there should be some groups in here that are doing one, 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 one. Remember we saw last time that you can choose to ignore female song and just go straight, and if you're lucky, sometimes you'll find a female and mate. The third. Uh, here it is. Here we go. Right. Exactly. So 70 males that don't listen to anything females have to say and just go straight. But there is a larger group here. There's already 547 males uh, that respond with 1311. And it turns out, again, this is just showing the males. It turns out that these males are responding to a group of females that have evolved. And those females only admit uh, only emit one of the first two songs. They never emit song three and four. Okay, but apparently they emit songs one and two at the right time in the right place for these males to respond. Right. So you'll notice that in the first two uh, the first two digits here go straight and turn right, turn right. Uh, these males are responding appropriately to those two songs, and they're benefiting. They're producing lots of sons, and the females that happen to emit those two songs at the right time in the right place produce, are producing lots of daughters. Okay, so we already, at time step 8000, have the evolution of signalers and listeners. Turns out that that's not all that happens, so let's keep going. After 10,000 time steps, we have, again, more and more males that are succeeding here. But we have another group here of males here, which are responding to a separate species of females that only emit the third and the fourth song. And apparently, those females are emitting songs three and four at the right time in the right place for these males to respond appropriately. So now we have not just the evolution of language, but the evolution of, uh, of speciation. We have two separate groups here that are emitting and responding to two separate languages. These are different languages because they're using two different sets of songs. Question? How do we know they're uh, 
that. The investigator said so. You can't see that from this picture, but they reported that. So males in this group never found females in this group. And males in this group never mated with fe male females in the other group. Uh, I just wanted to clarify a picture of it last time. It's, uh, when they reproduce, they're placed randomly, right? There's not like a geographic uh, Absolutely. distribution. Absolutely. That's right. Exactly. So they may be placed near a female of the other species. And presumably that, if they happen to land in the, the song radius of a female from another species, the male, in essence, doesn't hear it. All right, so if this male here lands in the uh, song radius of a female that emits song one and two, regardless of whether she emits song one or two, that male will go straight, right? Doesn't hear, doesn't respond to that <coughs> language. Okay, there's a small chance that that male may run into that female and they produce offspring, but it's much less likely than males that belong to that species. Okay. Exactly right. So if you remember back to the details, there's no crossover here. So even if that happened, you'd have a male that still listens for song three and four, and the female daughter produces song one and two. That's right. Okay. Uh, and we'll notice that our group here of males that just goes forward regardless of what happens, that species is slowly going extinct. Okay. If you were a male in this simulation at this point in time, what kind of mutation would you be hoping for? Let's imagine that you were a male offspring, a male child from each of these, either of these two species. What would you be hoping, what kind of mutation would you hope to receive? A combination of both, right, which you're not going to get because there's no crossover, right? But mutation, if you're lucky, will make what happen? That you can hear both songs. That you can hear both songs. And one more thing, remember evolution of uh, language is tricky. Respond in the correct way. Respond in the correct way. It turns out at this point in time, there are a few males on the board here that do so. Where are they? So it's not this group, right? Because we, we know this group just always goes forward. There are 20 males down here that go straight and turn to the right when they hear songs one and two, like this species. And they also go straight and turn right like males that belong to this species. Okay. So this group of 20 males is bilingual. They speak both languages and they know what to do when they hear either of those two languages. What do you think is going to happen? If we continue running this evolutionary process forward. Well, it would probably be better because both those groups are doing pretty well. They're going to keep producing more of their offspring. And if they understand both languages, Absolutely. They're, likely, they're more likely to find females because they can find females that belong to either species. So keep your eye on this cell and these two cells as I move forward. 12,000, 14,000, 16,000, 20,000, 30,000, and 40,000. One question would be, did that remove the selection pressure on the females? Did it remove the and selection did, did on which females? Remember, we now have two female species here. Right, right, that's what I'm saying, is, is the selection pressure between the, the one, two, and the three, four, right. if there is no selection pressure at that point on those? That's a good question. So what happened to the evolutionary selection pressure on those two female species? Interesting thing to think about. If there's a rising number of bilingual males, probably doesn't matter too much. You don't need to speak both languages. One is enough. OK, so an interesting experiment. Again, very, very simple. These agents don't do anything more than 
emit or respond to language, but you can see um, the evolution of language, the evolution of multiple languages, and the evolution of bilingualism. Okay. The human males in this room, there's lots to learn from this experiment beyond just the evolution of language. Okay. Shall we move on? Okay. Okay, so let's move on now to our last theme on evolving bodies uh, and brains. This is an interesting corner of uh, artificial intelligence and robotics because there was a landmark paper published back in 1994, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. This was the first attempt to evolve robot morphology and control, and you could argue that this is still the state of the art in this field. My lab and other labs have been trying to improve upon uh, Sims's work here. Tricky thing to do. So the high water mark was set back over 20 years ago now. Um, and as you'll see, it's a challenging thing to, to do. Okay. Start by playing the video. It's about five minutes long. And I don't think there's any sound, so I will narrate over this. Remember this is 1994. I told you up to this point that there were no physics engines. I lied. There was one physics engine. Sims himself wrote his own physics engine and then used it to evolve bodies and brains of uh, virtual creatures. The computer graphics is pretty good. Um, Carl Sims himself was a computer graphics researcher, so paid a lot of attention to getting the graphics right. In the same environment. The next group of creatures were evolved for their ability to move on a simulated land environment. Um, <laughs> so you'll notice that in some cases we've got locomotion over land and some are swimming. So not only did he create his own physics engine, he also approximated fluid dynamics, which is not an easy thing to do. Complicated to write the code to do so, and it's computationally expensive, which was amazing, again, given the fact that this was 1994. You'll notice that some of these machines are kind of random collections of blocks, but if you look carefully, there is some regularity in these robots, uh, some of them. This was actually a creature first evolved for its ability to swim in water. Then later put You'll notice that some of them have very smooth oscillations. What do you think exists in the neural networks inside these robots? The protrusions on its arms seem to help CPG, remember CPGs emit oscillations, so there are some CPGs in there. -like You'll notice some of these bodies have bilateral symmetry. The left side of the body looks like the right side of the body. This group was evolved for their ability to Here's phototaxis in water. Are now being interacted Not only did he write his own physics engine and fluid dynamics simulator and evolutionary robotics simulation, he also managed to evolve phototaxis. There's a reason why this was the, still the high water mark in the field. Here is one that has propeller-like fins which are tilted depending on the direction of... You'll notice that he's controlling the placement of the light source, which means this evolved creature is pretty robust to arbitrary placements of the light. We're going to focus at the end of this lecture on competition. So now we have pairs of robots. What's the fitness function here? Who can grab the block? Here, a strategy first arose for simply tumbling towards the cube. Then one learned to block out his opponent. Not only get towards the block, but make sure your competitor does not later, reach the block. The obstacle by climbing over it. Some pinned down their opponents. By Some whatever means necessary. Protective arms. <laughs> simply unfolded onto the cube. The success of a strategy is often highly dependent on the opponent. Here is a hockey playing creature. Which takes the this was a very successful solution, <laughs> <laughs> which of course then spread through the population. <laughs> this crab-like creature walks well, but often continues. Hyperaggression also <laughs> evolved <laughs> in some cases. <laughs> Forget about the block altogether. And just beat up on your opponent. Against the arm, the crab seems to simply walk away. I think there's a TV show called Robo Wars or Robot Wars. A this was the original Robot this Wars. This two-arm technique that swipes quickly in from the side <coughs> and moves the cube over to a second arm. These are the final rounds of competition amongst the overall best.
Finally, the seeker arm goes against the side swiper, but the cube is just out of reach. Okay. Okay, so how did Sims manage to accomplish all this? He used a supercomputer at the time called the Connection Machine 5. Um, this was a very popular machine at the time. I apologize for the lights here, but uh, the CM5 actually had a cameo in the first Jurassic Park movie. Um, had this beautiful front panel with blinking, uh, blinking lights, which would show when each of the uh, 1,024 cores was actually active and when it was uh, passive. Um, why was it called the CM5? You can go back and read about this machine. It was a very interesting idea. Um, they had a thousand cores, and these cores were connected to five neighboring cores. So if you drew this in five dimensions, almost every uh, core would be attached to almost every other core along the five dimensions. Um, this machine had an R peak, so this was sort of uh, at its peak performance. It could perform 131 billion floating point operations per second. So remember, FLOPS is measuring sort of how many operations it can do, how quickly. Um, a Mac Pro, not a MacBook Pro, but a Mac Pro, which is this top of the line personal Mac PC at the moment that you can buy, has a, a peak of slightly less than that. Um, of course, a Mac Pro is a little bit smaller than the CM5, but still, this was a pretty impressive machine, even by today's standards. So in the evolutionary uh, algorithms that Sims ran, we're going to see in a moment, all of them had a population size of 300. He ran it for about 100 generations, and it took about three hours, so not bad. Do you have a question? Is, the, is this... So like the $13,000 Mac that has like 128 cores? This is the $5,000 Mac. I'm not sure about the $13,000 one. Oh, you can one. upgrade that. Yes, you can upgrade. Um, yes, I'm sure you can buy a Mac that outcompetes the CM5 at this point, but you're going to have to be pretty rich to do so. <clears throat> okay, so again, over 20 years ago, this was a pretty impressive machine for its time and, and still today. Okay, quite a bit of computation going into this. Okay. There was a lot that went into designing this evolutionary algorithm. As I mentioned, one of the challenges about evolving bodies and brains is picking a good genotype to phenotype mapping. So remember the genotype is the blueprint, the thing that encodes. In this case now, it's going to have to encode both the body and brain. And the phenotype is the thing that's produced by the genotype, which, as always for us, is a simulated uh, robot. We've seen genotypes encoded as vectors. We've seen them encoded as matrices. We've talked a few times now about genetic programming, which is an evolutionary algorithm that encodes uh, genotypes as trees. The genotype we're going to look at today is a graph. And not only is it a graph, it's a nested, directed, multigraph. And I'm going to unpack those three um, I'm going to unpack those three terms uh, as we go. Here are three genotypes uh, on the left here. And again, phenotypes are simulated robots with morphology and control. Now, we noticed, you notice in the video, and you can see here that a lot of these phenotypes are not, these phenotypes are not just random collections of blocks, but we see symmetry, repetition. The robot you see in the top right actually has a fractal pattern. And we tend, we're able to bias evolution towards these, uh, these regular patterns by using a recursive mapping. <laughs> so what we're going to see is we translate or map the genotype into the phenotype. We're going to traverse these graph genotypes recursively. And by doing so, it produces these regular patterns. We've already seen an evolutionary algorithm that tends to bias evolutionary search towards symmetry and repetition, what was that evolutionary algorithm? <clears throat> Hyperneat, right? So remember Hyperneat, I showed you the example of how it paints colored pixels across a two-dimensional plane or a three-dimensional uh, volume. Um, when Sam was here guest lecturing, he showed how you can use it to paint voxels across a soft robot. Hyperneat was invented many years after Sims's approach and used a different genotype to phenotype mapping, the CPPNs, or Compositional Pattern Producing Networks, that are at the heart of Hyperneat, <laughs> used a different mapping to get the same result. Bias evolution towards not just random collections of things, but patterned collections of things. Okay, so let's spend a few slides looking at how this mapping actually works. 
Inside the genotype, we have a collection of nodes and edges. And the nodes in, are going to have a large number of labels attached to them. And these labels are going to have descriptions about how to construct body parts and also joints. So the first time through Sims's work, it seems obvious that you would use the nodes to encode body parts and edges to encode joints between body parts. That's not how things work here. Nodes are going to encode body parts and joints that connect the current body part back to its parent body part. Okay, so what are those node labels? Well, we have uh, three labels, X, Y, and Z, that represent uh, the shape and dimensions of a body part. Um, we have another, a fourth label which indicates what kind of joint type is going to connect that current body part back to its parent body part, hinge, ball and socket, uh, and so on. Two additional labels that, uh, that encode the low stop and the high stop of the joint, what's the range of motion of the joint. And finally, a binary tag called the recursive limit. And we're going to see how that works in a moment. We'll come back to that. Let's switch now to the edges. So let's say we start by, we're going to start construction of the phenotype at this node. We construct this part, which ends up being the body of the humanoid. Here we have all of the instructions in here about how to build uh, that part. And we are now going to follow all of these outgoing edges. And when we do, we're going to arrive at five nodes. We're going to arrive at this node, and then we're going to arrive at this node four different times. Each of these five edges is going to dictate how the new part that's built uh, how it's built relative to the part that was just built. So we just built the body. When we go and build the head, we're going to, as we travel along this edge, there's going to be some instructions about how the head object should be placed relative to the body. As you can imagine, that relative position is above the body. Put the head on top of the body. There may be additional tags associated with the edge that indicate a change in orientation of the child object relative to the parent object, change in scale. The new object may be half the size or twice the size of the original object. Um, and finally, this tag called reflection. So reflection is a binary tag that says, do all of these changes, orientations, and scales, and then reflect it on the other side. That's what gives us this bilateral symmetry that we see in a lot of these uh, cases here. Finally, uh, there is this terminal only flag, and this terminal only flag is associated with the recursive limit here. What it, uh, terminal only flag is a flag, it's binary. If it's set to two, if it's set to one, what it means, or set to true, what it means is you're only gonna follow this edge when the recursive limit at the parent so remember we're at the edge here. If the, uh, if the terminal only flag is set here and the recursive limit of the parent body part is zero, only in that case follow this edge. So what does that mean? Let's go back and now look at the recursive limit. As we are, let's take, uh, let's take this individual here. Um, as we traverse along the outgoing edges, we leave this uh, body part and arrive along the self edge back at the same body part. So we can arrive at the same edge, or we can arrive at the same node multiple times as we're translating the blueprint into the phenotype. Every time we visit a node, we decrement the recursive limit. Okay, so we visit multiple times, RL might start being at three. We visit it again, it goes to two. We visit again, it goes to one. We visit it again, it goes to zero. And now that the recursive limit is zero, if there are any outgoing edges that have a TO equal to true, only then do we follow that edge. Why are these additional details built in? Why dictate that some nodes are only visited when the parent node has been uh, visited multiple times and is done with construction. You don't want to produce that node too many times. You don't want to produce that node too many times. You only want to produce it once you've exhausted visits to the parent node. What does that mean? It could give you stuff like hands and feet 
Give you things like hands and feet, right? So you're constructing the upper leg, middle leg, lower leg, and maybe upper, middle, or upper and lower leg are being constructed by the same piece, by the same node. If you look carefully at this genotype, you'll notice that the body segment is made. Here's one body segment. We then travel across both of these outgoing edges that build an upper leg on either side. So we visited twice here, and then we follow the self loop, which visits self leg visits leg segment again and adds a part on the end. Right? So at that point, when we've exhausted this, there may be an addition, there could have been an additional edge and an additional node called hand or foot that would only be called when the upper and the lower leg had been built. We'd exhausted the recursive limit for the leg segment node. So it's sort of like an L system in turtle graphics? It's very so much like an L system in turtle graphics, which we're going to see in the next lecture. We're going to look at one that actually does use this. So yes, it has things in common with Lindenmeyer systems, for those of you that know what those are. If you don't, we'll talk about it on Thursday. Yes? Did, uh, I was going to ask if Sims gave this a name, this a name other than um, nested directed multi he did not. He should have, though. It would have made, saved us some time. Yeah. Yes, question. I'm not, I'm not sure I okay, let's, let's go through one and see how this works a little bit. So let's go to this. Let's start with this one here, which has the simplest genotype you can imagine. Okay? We have one node called segment. And as you can imagine, this one node called segment builds... A segment, right? So inside this node, there in, there's instructions that say build this long, tall, rectangular solid, right? Okay. So we've built this piece, we've visited this node once, and now we're going to follow each outgoing edge. Let's follow the left-hand edge first, okay? We travel along this left-hand edge, and as we do, we read the instructions about how to change the position and orientation of something, which is this thing. So we're now going to build a segment again. We're going to build another long, tall, rectangular solid. Instructions are embedded in here. But it's going to have a slightly different position and orientation relative to the original one. Right? We've built this. Let's travel along the left-hand edge again. We build this piece. We travel along the left-hand edge again. We build this piece. Travel along the edge again, build this piece, and we stop because the recursive limit has gone all the way down to zero. We're not allowed to follow any more outgoing edges. So if we count this off, we can infer that inside uh, that node, recursive limit equals five. Okay, but we were only following the left-hand edge, right? So let's go back to the main branch here and now follow the right path which builds this piece, follow the right path, it builds this piece, then this piece, and then this final piece that's pointing out of the screen towards us, right? So I'm describing this to you one at a time, but obviously when we actually execute this, it's following both paths in a recursive manner and building this bifurcated tree that you see here. So do we really like go all the way to one edge and all the way to the other? I don't think Sims specified whether he traverses the graph in a breadth first or a depth first manner. I'm not sure that it matters. It'd be an interesting thing to try out with pen and paper. Okay, so now you can sort of see how this game works. We build a body segment like this body segment here. We follow the self edge, builds another body segment. Follow the same self edge again, builds this body segment. We've exhausted the recursive limit in here, so we stop building body segments. And for each of those three body segments that we built, there were still two more outgoing edges that we needed to follow. And when we follow those two outgoing edges, one of, them, one of those outgoing edges builds this piece, the other outgoing edge builds this piece. Follow the self edge, build this piece, and so on. Make sense? Okay. So, if you think this makes sense, I want you to turn to your neighbor, pick one of these 12 robots, you can see the phenotype, 
And I want you to sort of sketch out, you don't have to do this in perfect detail, but what would be a genotype that would produce that phenotype? Don't bother filling in all the position and orientation labels. If you get sort of just the nodes and edges right, that should be sufficient. I'll give you a couple minutes to sketch out a genotype for one or a couple of these 12 robots, and then we'll see what you came up with. Good luck. <laughs> Yes. So if you, if you do position control, you put some points in the low and high stuff in your Okay. I'm not sure. You might want to email Colin Chappelle, who's the developer of Pirates. So if you send me an email, I can forward it on to him. Oh, he's hard to die for. I think it's a post. What's that? You can show me a video, but it might be hard for me to infer, but yes. Okay, let's see how you did at reverse engineering the genotypes for these phenotypes. Anyone want to volunteer a genotype? So six looks like what we just saw, except we one poor recursive limit on the fins. Exactly. So a recursive limit of one on the feet, right? We're only going to create one foot or one flipper. This happens to be a swimmer, right? So how many nodes exist in the genotype for robot number six? Two? And how do you know it's two? You, exactly, right? So you can, by visual inspection, see that there's just two unique parts here. And then the wiring up these two nodes will give you this, this pattern. Yep. So if the middle segment was different than the edges, yep. um, 
Could you have a node for the base? Um, I guess in this case, you'd start off in the middle. Yeah. But if you were to start on the ends, could you have a node go, uh, say, from the bottom piece to a different middle piece and then back to the bottom piece? Absolutely. So as you just described, right, you could have an edge piece, which is the tail piece and the head piece. You could have a middle piece, which immediately goes back here, right? So build an end piece, then build a middle piece, then build an end piece, and make sure that your recursive limit is exhausted when you come back to the second one and you're done. Exactly. Yeah. This is a hypothetical situation we're coming up with. A little bit trickier, what if you wanted an end piece that's the same at the tail and the head and an arbitrary number of middle pieces which are all identical? So we've got, let's go back, we've got an end piece, and we have a middle piece that we want to visit three times or five times, and then after creating five middle pieces, we want to go back here and build the end piece again on the head. Any ideas? Just go end piece to middle piece to make a recursive connection. End piece to middle piece, we want a recursive connection because we're going to build a middle piece, then a middle piece again, then a middle piece again. A connection back. If we just add a piece going back, that means every time we build a middle piece, remember we're going to travel along both outgoing edges. So we need one final detail here to make this work. We want to go from the end piece to the middle piece and just travel along this outgoing edge until we've built all the middle pieces we want and only then, when we're done, do we want to follow this piece back? So what piece are we missing here to make that happen? Have a look at the node and edge labels that are available to you over here. Is it the terminal only flag that you want to add on the recursive one? Exactly. So we're going to add, we're going to flag this edge with a terminal only flag set to true, which means when the parent recursive limit, and the parent of this edge is this node, when the recursive limit here drops down to zero, if we set the recursive limit here to five, we're gonna build five middle segments. When the recursive limit here gets to zero, terminal only flag is true, then we follow the backward edge and build the final end piece at the front of the, the robot. Okay, we haven't said anything about mutation and crossover yet. Right? So what do you think mutation and crossover does to these genotypes? Changes any, or, yeah, changes any of the node or edge label uh, or specifications. Exactly. Um, or it can add another arrow or take away an arrow. It can, add, it can modify any of the labels. So a mutation might go in and change these labels, exactly like a mutation might go in and change a synaptic weight in your weight matrix, right? For example, if we have a recursive limit of five here, and it builds a C creature with an end, two end pieces and middle pieces in the center, if a mutation goes in and changes recursive limit from five to seven, what impact does that have on the phenotype? What's the new phenotype, what's the mutated phenotype going to look like? Longer. Longer, right? We're going to still have two end pieces and seven middle pieces, and the details of those middle and end pieces are identical to the parent. So we've changed the body by mutating one of these flags inside. We can, in addition, add and remove edges here and add and remove nodes. So mutation can also alter the structure of the graph itself, which also has an impact on the phenotype. Okay. Up till now, we have just been talking about the body. So what about the brain, right? Again, as I mentioned, it's difficult to co-optimize body and brain. So uh, as always in this experiment, uh, Sims came up with a brilliant idea, which is to embed local neural circuits inside each uh, node here. So I promise to unpack the three adjectives describing these graphs. So a nested graph is a graph in which every node of the graph has nested inside of it another graph. Right? 
So what, is these, what are these graphs that are embedded inside? This dictates that there's certain neurons and synapses that should be placed inside this node. So you'll notice that um, our body part node here that builds uh, these two central body parts have these three neurons inside. These neurons have a certain labels associated with them, which is going to dictate how these neurons behave. We'll come back to that in a moment. These two outgoing edges here build the left and right fin, and in each of the four fins, there are four copies of this six neuron circuit. Okay, uh, J0 and J1, uh, J0 and J1 represent uh, the joint sensor for the two degrees of freedom of the fin. So in this particular example here, the fin is connected to the main body with two hinge joints, which allow this kind of thing. And so J0 and J1 are two sensors that are reporting this angle and this angle. Those sensor values are flowing through this neural network and arriving at E0 and E1, which is the effector, and the effector is just another name for a motor. It's affecting the two motors that, that control this joint and this joint. Okay. There is one additional special node that can be added to the genotype, which is a non-local brain. So this is one neural circuit that only exists in one copy in the body of the robot. So if the robot needs some centralized control, it should go in that uh, non-local brain component. Okay, so if we now take this genotype in its entirety and unroll it, this is what you get. So if you look carefully here, you'll notice um, we've got the fin down here, a couple of the fins, and then saw, wave, and ITP at the top here, just one copy, that's the non, uh, the, the, the central brain. Okay, so that unpacks the first of these adjectives, the nested, uh, nested graph, as you can see. The other two are actually easy, um, directed in that the edges have directions to them. These are arrows and not lines. So we're always traveling from one node to another node. And finally, a multigraph is just a fancy way of saying that any pair of nodes can have zero, one, or more than one edge between them. It can have multiple edges. Okay, so that fully describes now uh, the genotype. What are these uh, little labels inside the neurons? Well, Sim wasn't happy with just summing up the raw sum and then sending out the value along the outgoing edge, which is the sum neuron that you see here. He created a whole bunch of other neurons, like product, which would take all of the incoming values and instead of summing them, take the product, push that through an activation function and send it out along outgoing uh, edges. He had a whole bunch of other kinds of uh, functions here. And then finally down here, he had two different kinds of central pattern generators. One that would output a, a wave function, which is just a sinus, sinusoidal pattern like we've seen before. And the second one is a sawtooth pattern that would produce a sawtooth pattern like this on its outgoing synapses. So if you go back and watch the Sims video, you'll see a lot of these smooth oscillations and also sort of jerky movements like this, which is being produced by the saw, the saw wave uh, central pattern generator. Okay. Okay, we mentioned mutation, how mutation can add and remove nodes, add and remove edges, or, uh, ind or alter individual flags. Um, this is one of these papers that just keeps going. So there was not only mutation, but also crossover. How do you take two nested directed multigraphs, cross them together, and produce child nested directed multigraphs? Um, there are different ways to do this. Um, this was one way that uh, Sims came up with, which is to take each graph and align all of the nodes linearly, like you see here. Do that for two parent genotypes that have survived in the population, and start copying along the length of one of them until you get to some randomly selected crossover point. So evolution says 
cross at this point. At that point, move along the cross to the parent, second parent, start copying nodes and edges from the parent. So copy this node, copy its edges, copy this node, copy its edges. We hit another crossover point, so cross back to the first parent and copy its remaining nodes and edges. So here's a way to cross over two uh, graphs, which you can see visually are different from one another. And they produce a third child graph, which is similar to, but not identical to, either of the parent graphs. Okay. He also came up with a different way of combining genetic material from two parents, which is grafting. So start copying one parent at random. Take one of the edges in parent one, disconnect it from uh, some node in parent one, and randomly reconnect it to a random node in parent two. And when you get to that modified edge, which is the dashed line here, travel along that edge to parent two and copy the remainder of parent two. That's grafting. It seems to me like there's a possibility where the parents could keep getting longer and yep. the children could then keep growing in length. Absolutely, and this is another problem in the field. It's known as bloat, which is if you actually look at the genotypes along an evolutionary run, it's exactly what you see. These graphs get larger and larger and larger over time. How does actual evolution solve that? How does actual evolution solve like, the bloat problem? fundamentally, like, there's a physical limit on, like, how much DNA or stuff, how big we can get. Absolutely. So there's a physical cost. How much DNA can you pack in a cell's nucleus? And how much energy does it take to copy a very a big piece of DNA? As always in nature, those are just two of probably 300 reasons why, or the ways in which Mother Nature uh, combats bloat in biological genetic material. Okay, good, good question. Okay, so we have mutation and crossover, and as always, they're, they're combining genetic material from two parent graphs. Yes? It's, uh, kind of related to that last thing. Um, yes. So do these, um, or any of these major algorithms incorporate uh, removing body parts or removing something almost to Absolutely. So um, as you can see here, the child is actually the same size as the parent. And you can do this with pen and paper. You can take those two parents and choose one or two crossover points at <clears throat> random. And some of those randomly chosen crossover points will produce a child which is smaller than either of the parents. It is possible. Yeah. Mutation will also do it. It can remove a node or an edge. Um, in my years of creating these kinds of experiments, I've tried every genotype, every fitness function, every physics engine, every environment you can imagine. Generally speaking, a mutation that adds genetic material has a higher chance of being beneficial than removing something. Right? I can open your laptop and randomly add a piece. It's probably going to break your laptop, but I might get lucky. I'm much less likely to remove a part at random and make your laptop not only work, but work a little bit better. Right? It's extremely unlikely, as you can, you can imagine. OK, following along on that theme, as you can imagine, most of the child uh, genotypes here probably did worse than both parents because we have the competing conventions problem. If you go back and look at our lecture on NEAT and hyperneat. Um, that showed that it's very difficult to randomly combine genetic material from two uh, networks or graphs. Um, so hyperneat, again, uh, sorry, neat was a response to this paper to try and come up with a better way of recombining genetic material from two networks. Okay. Regardless, as you saw from the video, Sims was still able to get some pretty uh, sophisticated creatures in, con con uh, in addition to creatures that could compete over a common resource. So we got five minutes left, so we'll end with our uh, competitors here. Here's the arena. They're competing over this cube. Creature one had to start behind this dotted line, and it had to be lower than this inclined diagonal plane placed in front of it. Why did Sims put this diagonal plane at the starting zone for both robots? 
you know, kind of decaying at your optimal lengths that are really close to you as well. So I don't think he mentions it in the paper, but you can be sure that he hit up against perverse instantiation, where the starting zone said just be behind that dotted line, and you got creatures that evolved to be very tall and fell on the object, right? If you go back and watch the video, you can still see that kind of happening where you get creatures that start just under the diagonal plane and do this when the green light flashes, right? Okay, same thing for creature two. What are the fitness functions? for these two creatures. They each have their own genetic material, they're not clones of one another, so we're gonna assign one fitness value to robot one and another fitness value to robot two. What do you think those fitness functions look like? Maybe, you know, the first time you touch the cube. Okay, could do that, we could have a term in there to minimize the time it takes for you to touch the cube. Or maximize distance to your competitor Things you could throw so a whole bunch there. of things. What are some of the other things we could do? Minimize your distance to Q while maximizing your competitor's distance. Exactly. So as you can see from the video, they were trying to minimize their distance to the cube for sure. But there were others that were also trying to maximize their competitor's distance from the cube. Right. So the fitness function for robot one, F1, says minimize my distance. Right? So make sure D1 is as small as possible. We're subtracting D1. D is a distance, which means it's always going to be positive. So make sure that's as small as possible. D2 is the distance between the cube and my competitor. And make sure that value is as big as possible. And then the denominators in both cases are to normalize it. Right? Symmetrically for robot 2, minimize robot 2's distance from the target object and maximize the distance between the competitor and the object. Okay. All right, so that's the fitness function we're going to use. We have a big population of robots and we're going to compete pairs of robots against one another. How do we estimate the general ability of any one robot? Not how well it did against robot J, but against every other robot J in the population. There's different ways we can do this, and let's focus on the left-hand column here. The most obvious thing we could do is take our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight robots here and compete each of the eight robots against each of the other seven robots. Right? What's the problem with that approach? Yeah, more likely. More likely to lose diversity because we're going to have one that's going to take over the population. Maybe. Possibly, that that might happen. There's another problem here. It's also expensive. It's expensive, right? If you have a population size of 300, as I think he had, that's 300 times 299 competitions, right? It's extremely expensive, even if you had a state-of-the-art supercomputer at the time. So let's go to the other extreme. Let's take our population and just pair up robots at random and compete uh, one robot against every other robot. Or sorry, let's, let's then simulate each pair of robots. So if we have a population size of 300, how many simulations are we running? 150, right? So pretty... Pretty cheap, right? It's actually better than just doing one individually. So what's the problem with that approach? Sorry? You have four victors. You have four victors, right? So we have we have uh, two in, we have half the individuals that have a fitness of high fitness, and the other individuals have low fitness. We don't really know much about how the how the winners, how the n over two winners do against one another, right? So that doesn't work as well. It's fast, but we get a pretty poor fitness estimate of the individuals. We only know how they did against one robot, not how well they did against the other robots. So option number three, we just finished uh, March Madness, right? So is to create a bracket. So pair up each robot at random with a buddy. They compete against each other. The winner goes on in the bracket to play against the winner from another pairwise competition. How many simulations do we need to run in this case? Uh, it's log of n. It's log of n, right? Okay. 
Last one, so log of, of n is good, still pretty cheap. What's the problem with a bracket? You have one robot losing the first round that is better than all but the first one that it played, except that second, the one that it played first could be worse than all the others. Could be, right? So I'm the, I happen to be the second best robot in the population, and I get teamed up with the best robot in the population, right? I'm knocked out in the first round, so my fitness estimate is the worst or close to the bottom, right? So the system has made an erroneous approximation of my fitness value, right? So a, bra a bracket doesn't work very well. We'll discuss the all versus best competition on Thursday. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. Uh, thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.